The details of the 999 call that was made at 6.09 from within White House Farm that was hidden by the police. If a call was made from within the farm at that time, then there is no question. It wasn't him and therefore he's innocent. Hello and welcome back to Crime Suspect. Each week, we unravel some of the UK's most prolific crimes, as well as providing in-depth analysis on the criminality that plagues our nation. On the show today, guilty or not guilty? The case of Jeremy Bamber and the massacre of his family was one that shocked the nation and dominated the headlines. But as we seek to understand some new evidence, could it be that this cold-blooded killer is innocent? Next up, we'll be bringing you the best and worst of policing with our good cop, bad cop. And finally, it's your chance to book a crook as we show you this week's wanted criminals. Joining me for all of this today is Philip Walker from the Jeremy Bamber Innocence Campaign, Matt Harris, independent filmmaker, and behavioural psychologist, Joe Hemmings. Thank you all very much for being here. Now, you have the right to remain watching. This is Crime Suspect. This was one of the worst mass slayings of a family in the UK's history. In 1985, in the idyllic village of Tolishant Darcy in Essex, three generations of the Bamba family, including two young children, were shot 25 times at close range at their family home, the White House Farm. Bamba, now 63 years old, is serving a whole life tariff for these crimes. The sentencing judge, Mr Justice Drake, said that Bamba was warped and evil beyond belief. But from behind bars, Bamba has spent years fighting to prove his innocence and has always maintained that his adoptive sister, Sheila Caffell, a paranoid schizophrenic, shot his adoptive parents, Neville and June Bamba, and her six-year-old twins, Daniel and Nicholas, before turning the gun on herself. Since his incarceration in 1986 at His Majesty's Prison Wakefield, Bamba has appealed several times for his original conviction to be overturned, but despite his efforts, he's set to die in jail. Philip, you claim to have evidence that proves Jeremy is innocent. We don't have the time to go through the millions of documents that you've poured over. But if there was one or two key points that would indicate Jeremy Bamber's innocence, what would they be? Well, I'd point out three to start with. Uh, firstly, the fact that his, Sheila, uh, his sister, Sheila Caffell, uh, who was rightly identified by the police as the culprit initially, was still alive in White House Farm after the police arrived at around four uh, o'clock in the morning. Uh, and we have multiple ways to show that she was still alive. And that fact means that Jeremy could not have murdered her as he was convicted of, because at that time he was standing outside, surrounded by several dozen police officers. But the police didn't enter the building until gone six o'clock, did they? Well, they entered about 7.30, and that's because they thought, quite rightly, that it was a siege situation. They knew that somebody was alive in the house and reacted accordingly. But under most siege situations, one would wait for either somebody to surrender, to give themselves up, or wait until there was no other living person before entering the premises. So how can you say that Sheila was alive at four o'clock? What evidence supports that? Well, multiple ways. Firstly, um, when the police first arrived, two officers, uh, along with Jeremy, did a recce of the house, and they saw movement uh, in the upper windows of the house. And that was the reason they called out firearm support, which at that time was a major thing to do. It uh, meant waking up a senior officer in the middle of the night to ask for permission to do that. Uh, and clearly the situation was being taken extremely seriously. Uh, further to that, there were changes in the status of the lights in the house. They were going on and off at various times before the firearms team went in. Curtains were being opened and closed. There's records in the police logs that they were in conversation with somebody inside the house at about quarter past five in the morning. And as a result, 
uh, of that uh, at 6.09 in the morning, the central uh, Essex Police headquarters received a 999 call from White House form. Uh, and that could only have been made clearly by somebody alive in the house. And then when the raid team actually went into the premises, they recorded that there were two bodies, one of a male and one of a female, downstairs in the kitchen of the house. Now, that can only have been Neville Bamber, who everybody accepts was deceased in the kitchen, and Sheila Bamber. But what we believe happened is that Sheila was actually only unconscious in the kitchen. When the raid team started smashing down the back door, she woke up, ran upstairs, and then tragically about half an hour later committed suicide. But the police had initially seen her in the kitchen, and that's what they recorded in their logs. That there was one dead male and one dead female in the kitchen. And all those factors taken together show that, clearly, Sheila was still alive in the house. Were these factors presented at Jeremy's original trial? Some of them were. Uh, Why not all of them? Well, because the, the main exculpatory evidence that we have now that's currently being considered by the CCRC came from a, a partial disclosure in 2011. Up to that point, the police had, and various other bodies, such as the um, Forensic Science Service, had sat on relevant documents and just refused to release them. But because of a change in uh, the rules governing public interest immunity certificates, which made them far more restrictive in how they could be uh, applied, uh, there was a big disclosure of about 300,000 documents in 2011. And most of this new material that's been considered by the CCRC now comes from that disclosure, which was after the trial, obviously, and after the 2002 appeal. Matt, have you been poring over many of these documents? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've sort of been involved in this for about three years now. And, and initially, I, uh, I, I kind of felt the same as everyone else, that, that you know, Bamber had been guilty all this time. And then I contacted Philip and the campaign team as, as I sort of dug deeper into the story and they started sending me documents. So, yeah, I've, I've spent three years really looking into it. And the deeper into it you go, the more kind of obvious is that this is an unsafe conviction. When was the moment that you thought, this is unsafe, I must help, and what was it that made you think that? I think the moment really was, like Philip said, it's, it's kind of when you realise that, that Sheila was alive inside the house while Jeremy's outside with 40 police officers. As he has said to me in correspondence, that's not a bad alibi to have. And, and all the evidence kind of shows that. You can't kind of refute that. Joe, Jeremy Bamber, of course, remains convicted of these crimes. And knowing what you do of him and the case, have you been able to sort of formulate any kind of psychological profile of Jeremy Bamber? I think there's quite a lot of study research done into his personality, and I think it was believed that he had borderline personality disorder. I actually think he may have had narcissistic personality disorder. Now, you get 40% of people with BPD also have MPD. And that would mean that he had a rather inflated sense of self. Um, you know, he had sort of fantasies, very high level of self-esteem, attention-seeking. Look, he had a motive. Uh, there was money to be had, there was money to be made, uh, an inheritance. We know that he had difficulties with his parents, with his mother in particular growing up. So you could look at him and say he has this kind of character, very good looking, he didn't seem to show any remorse, he went to all these funerals, you know, all that piecing that together didn't seem to show any grief. You would indicate he had some sort of personality disorder for sure. Have you seen those personality disorders in other killers? Yes, you get certainly this lack of empathy, um, you get the lack of emotion, you get the lack of remorse, you also get that single-mindedness that is very focused on what they want to achieve without any sense of empathy, perspective or consideration of, of anybody else other than the fact that they want to, to, to kill this person. And you see it a lot in serial killers. Could I just come back on the points that Joe's raised? And what, what she's saying is supposition, and I, I think she's predicating it on the fact that if he was guilty, he would have these traits. Now, Jeremy is assessed very regularly in the prison system for his psychological state, 
and we can provide you with a report, um, a very detailed report from a Professor Vincent Egan, who, who did a very in-depth study of Jeremy um, back in about 2009, which shows that he has no personality disorders whatsoever, he shows no signs of psychopathy, and he is a, a, a reasonable, well-adjusted person. Have you ever discussed with him the pretty well-founded allegations that he was cruel to animals when he was a child? Well, that, that is... Yeah. What, what you should remember is that when all these stories were coming out, Jeremy was on remand in prison. His family had been wiped out. Nobody was defending him. And it was the police and the relatives who benefited financially from his conviction that were putting all these stories into the press. Do you think that there is any likelihood at any stage that these convictions will be overturned? Or is it simply a man who has been incarcerated for 38 years and faces the prospect of dying in jail, what else would he do? Yeah, well, no, I, I know that these convictions will be overturned because the evidence on which they were based is totally unsound. One of the prime examples of that uh, is the radio logs that we were discussing earlier. Uh, and one of the key exculpatory factors that we put to the uh, CCRC is that the police received a phone call from Neville Bamber, Jeremy's father, at 3.26 in the morning, uh, alerting them to the unfolding drama at White House Farm. And if that phone call was made, as the police recorded it, from Neville Bamber at White House Farm at that time, there is no way that Jeremy could have uh, uh, completed the shootings because he was in Goldhanger, three miles away, and the police accept that he made a phone call to them at either 3.36 or 3.26 from there. So it's 1985, very much an analogue era. Digital clocks weren't on the walls of police control centres and stations and all of that. And I know that because I was there at the time. Not here, but in various police buildings. You seem to, to lay great store on a discrepancy between what we're calling document one, which is a log of a phone call made to the police, and document two, written by a different person, which essentially dispatches police units to White House Farm. The original log says that the call was received at 3.36 and time of dispatching various units would appear to be 3.26. Is it upon this discrepancy, written by two different people, at half past three in the morning, that you are largely basing your defence? No, it's not. I mean, this is just one small part of the material that we've given to the CCRC. Uh, and in this particular issue, we're not relying purely on these two documents. Uh, amongst the other bundle that we provided you with was a note from somebody at Whitham Police Station, who was part of the response to the incident, who recorded that he spoke to PC West at 3.37 and PC West said in his statement that he rung this individual after he had spoken to Jeremy for one minute. So that ties in exactly with the fact that Jeremy's phone call was at 3.36. Now, at trial, the judge ordered the jury to assume the phone call was made at 3.26, because at that point, nobody had any inkling that a second call from Jeremy's father had been made to the police. So the defence had, had no idea that there was any sort of unsoundness to this proposition. But when it emerged that a call had been made, that obviously completely changed the situation. Or it could be one call that is recorded by two people. Only one person, of course, took that call. And the information that's relayed to them could have been recorded at a different time, purely through human error. I strongly suspect that Essex Police had rarely, if ever, been confronted by a set of circumstances like this, at half past three in the morning mm -hmm. or thereabouts. Yeah. It must have been incredibly high pressured for them, yeah. I would imagine. Uh, to err is human, and I would imagine that may well have been a factor. Matt, have you seen these documents? Have yes. you poured over them? Yes, I have. And your summary is? The, exactly. I mean, the, the same as Philip. I mean, one, one of the things on those documents is that you can see that at 3.35 a car is dispatched, so there's already a car on its way to White House Farm before the 3.36 call. So there must have been this 3.26 call. I think if you, if you kind of look into all of the documents in this case, 
that the police, Essex police, specifically use human error uh, to sort of sell their narrative of what actually happened in not just the phone calls, but in lots of other scenarios, you know, around they made a mistake of the moonlight in the window. There's just so many. I mean, it's a, it's a sort of catalogue of errors by Essex police. They were even nicknamed the Cluzo Squad after this. A narrative put forward by the prosecution, which was compelling for the jury and which returned guilty verdicts. I think, I mean... Go Joe, um, once again, referring to what we know of Bamba and the amount of time that he spent in prison, would the personality traits that we touched on beforehand be ever present or is there a likelihood that they could dissipate or simply disappear? They wouldn't totally disappear, but they could be very well managed. So if you do have either borderline personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder, one of the traits is to be highly manipulative. Um, and in which case you're, you're very good at lying, you're very good at giving your case, you're very charming, articulate, eloquent in many ways. So those traits may well still be there, but these people are very good at covering those up, even under quite intense psychiatric scrutiny. And somebody who's been incarcerated for nearly 40 years, it's surely no surprise that trying to secure their innocence would be the dominating factor in their life. Very much so. If you look at any uh, major killers who have ended up in for life sentences, they will, 99.9%, .9 continue to protest their innocence throughout that entire period. And many have convinced themselves over a period of time, in fact, that they are innocent. So, again, their, their, their brains are kind of deciding for themselves that they didn't do this thing. And you keep repeating these things to yourself and you end up with this self-belief and this conviction that, that you shouldn't have been convicted. So that's, that's not surprising. How big a motive to murder can money be? Look, it can be huge. You know, in this particular case, he was an adopted child. There may or may not have been some resentment there, particularly if he felt he should have had a, a better life or could have had a different life. Uh, he was a young man. You know, to have to inherit that sort of money would have been an enormous motive. Many, many uh, killings, murders have been done within families in order to, to inherit money, and the Bam family had a lot of money. The silencer got quite a bit of airtime. Um, and, of course, it's been a subject of huge discussion yes. over the years. Yes. And I think I'm right in saying that part of the prosecution case was that Sheila could not have killed herself using the silencer and then removed it and have it later right. found in a cupboard. Yes. How do you refute that evidence? Well, I'd, I'd start a discussion on that by saying that we know that there was no silencer on the gun. We had extensive um, reports done by eminent US pathologists. Uh, there were three of them, and they were chief medical examiners of Maryland, uh, Virginia, uh, and one of the other states. And they agreed unanimously, looking at the crime scene photos, analysing all the forensic reports, that no moderator was on the gun during the shootings. But the, the, the prosecution had to introduce the moderator because it was the only evidence they had the blood evidence and the paint evidence that supposedly was on one single moderator was their case, basically. So it was essential they got it into court. Joe, if I were to put you on a spot, which is exactly what I'm <laughs> going to do, with your knowledge of the case and your analysis of Jeremy Bamber, would you say that he had every motive in the world to carry out these killings? Look, I say he had plenty of motive, not every motive in the world, but there was a clear motive. And I think behaviourally, and again, it's got to be supposition, I've never met him, but behaviourally indicators would suggest that he does have a personality disorder. Yeah, it's perfectly reasonable and possible that he had the motive and he did do it. Right, moving on to this week's Cop Watch. Good cop this week or good cops, rather, is the Economic Crime Unit from Greater Manchester Police, who collectively seized £15 million worth of criminal proceeds during the last tax year. The unit consists of a number of specialist teams that ensure criminals have all their ill-gotten gains removed. 
The results make them one of the best performing economic crime units in the country and the money collected goes back into local community initiatives and policing operations across Greater Manchester. Bad cop. And proving this is another rotten apple that's not above the law is Officer X, a copper in the Met who drew sexual cartoons of himself and a junior Muslim colleague. This anonymous officer drew another series of cartoons depicting himself and an officer engaging in sexual acts and titled it A Modern Love. Officer X has been allowed to keep his job and was given a final written warning at misconduct proceedings. That despite drawing similar cartoons of yet another junior female officer. All right, it's time for the part of the show where we bring you mugs of thugs who are terrorising our streets. But first, yet another success. From one of our appeals in our last episode, Jack Crawley has been detained and charged with attempted murder and possession of an offensive weapon in public. Thank you to everyone who called in with information. Now, moving on to this week's Wanted. Have you seen these criminals? First up is this suspect. Surrey police are looking for Troy Johnson from Rushington for conspiracy to commit aggravated burglary. Rushington is 34, described as a white man with brown hair and a short beard. Next, we have Catalin Bostan, who's wanted after a stabbing incident in Newham. The 46-year-old Romanian national is described as approximately 5 foot 8 inches tall and of stocky build. Lastly, have you seen this man? 30-year-old Bradley Hunter from Tadcaster is being sought after North Yorkshire Police in relation to domestic abuse offences. Hunter is described as white, 5 foot 5 inches tall, of proportionate build with mousy coloured hair and brown eyes. If you think you know or have seen any of these crooks, please get in touch anonymously with Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Right, that's all we've got time for this week. Many thanks to Philip, Matt and Joe. Be sure to leave us a comment, like and subscribe and we'll be back next week for more Crime Suspects.